Amen. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Don, for playing the piano this morning. And uh, she was playing the piano, doing such a wonderful job. Uh, not having uh, Teresa here. Most churches, they don't have a piano player here. They don't know what they would do. And I got to thinking about this. Our piano players, and this is the best analogy I could come up with, it's like the big red machine of piano players, okay? I mean, you got one, and uh, if uh, they're not there, they're out of town, they're on vacation, we got another one that can just step in and uh, take over and do just as wonderful of a job. So Teresa always does wonderful, and of course, Rose Marie uh, does a wonderful job playing the piano, and then, of course, Don, uh, stepping in this morning, did a wonderful job. Appreciate that, and uh, everyone else who plays the piano as well. I'm not going to name any more names because I was getting myself in trouble, but everyone does does a wonderful job, uh, but wonderful to have uh, so many uh, people who are able to step in. Appreciate you doing that this morning. Don, she said, Pastor, I'm just so nervous. And I thought she doesn't look nervous when she's up there, so she always does good, and I appreciate uh, her willingness to serve in whatever capacity uh, is, uh, is necessary. I've got good news and I've got bad news this morning. Good news is I've got less time than I normally do. Bad news is I've got about enough notes here for six different sermons, okay? So we're going to kind of pick our way through that. And, uh, of course, last Sunday was Resurrection Sunday. It was uh, Easter. It was the celebration of the triumph of, D of Jesus Christ uh, over the grave. Turn, turn your Bibles to, to John chapter number 20. You'll see that I have here uh, as my title this morning, The Resurrection Roadmap. How many of you ever used a roadmap before? Anybody? I'm not... Now, teenagers and young people, I'm not talking about a, a global positioning system, okay? I'm talking about a road map. I'm talking about an atlas. My dear mother, my dear mother, they, they, they traveled all the way out west, and she decided that she was going to navigate them by a road atlas. Listen, this wasn't 1987 that they were doing this. This was last year that they did this. <laughs> And she, we won't talk about me having to save them and use find my, uh, find my old people, I mean find my parents uh, on my phone and uh, help guide them out of a, a vast uh, wilderness that they were, uh, that they were in. Uh, but uh, uh, road maps uh, are important. A plan is important, isn't it? A, a, a direction, knowing where we're going. And uh, certainly there's atlases and there's road maps and there's GPSs. And if all of those fail, men, we always have our wives to tell us which direction to go. So uh, there's a, a lot of different sources that we can go to when we look at, uh, at uh, road maps. Yeah, I, I thought about this. I don't know how I ever got where I was going before I got married. And uh, so I just, it's a, it's a wonder I didn't just wander around in circles all the time. And uh, I better be careful. My wife's not here. She's probably listening online. Love you, babe. Um, <laughs> That was just a joke. <laughs> but uh, I was thinking as we, we consider this, how do you think the disciples and the followers uh, of Christ felt on resurrection morning? We see triumph. We see victory. We have the completion of Scripture to help us understand what the, the, uh, the empty tomb meant. Well, we're going to read here in a second. You know what we're going to find out? We're going to find out that some of them didn't know what to think about the empty tomb. Well, we know that Mary said what? They've come and, and done what? And, and stolen his body. Think of the fear. Think of the concern. Think of the uncertainty and the anxiety that existed in their lives. Everything they, they had invested into over the last three years plus was now what? It's now gone. The question that we often ask ourselves probably rang true in their hearts and in their minds. Where to now? What's next? I was in Budapest, Hungary with my wife. There were some others who were with us and there was a large group that were there. And we uh, had been there for several days, and we thought, you know what, we know our way around this area of the city pretty well. And we had a map, a fold-out map, of the city of Budapest. Now, the city of Budapest is a large city. And we thought, uh, you know what, we're going to venture out because we really needed something that we felt the Lord wanted us to have. And that something was ice cream. <laughs> And so we, we got into this van, and we had a driver. And the person behind the driver next to him, I can't remember, had the map. 
and uh, our driver wasn't real great. I'm just going to put it out there. But they were the only one that could drive the van, okay? And uh, they couldn't see real good. And them not being able to see real good was only amplified uh, by their even poorer vision at nighttime. And you guessed it, it was nighttime. Anybody have a hard time seeing at night? What's the only thing worse than it being nighttime if you suffer from night blindness at all? Rain. If it was raining, guess what? It was raining. The good news is this. We couldn't read any of the signs either because they were all in Hungarian. So this person who remained nameless, but initials may be Dale Money, was driving, <laughs> was driving the van. And uh, somebody had the map. And we knew where our hotel was. And we knew where this park called Hero Square was and what it looked like. That was a big landmark behind it. And we started driving, and it wasn't long, and we realized we had no idea where we were at. We wandered around that city for a couple hours. We gave the map to no less than six different people in that van. One of them was, this is true, they were reading the map upside down. <laughs> That's how lost we were. And no matter who we gave the map to, nobody had any idea where we were at. They couldn't locate us on the map. And all of a sudden, we came around the corner and we saw these bright blue lights. Immediately, we knew where we were at. We were in this square. And this square was lined with 20 huge granite statues of war heroes from Hungary. It was called Hero Square. It was right behind our hotel. The problem was this. We all knew where we were at that point, but we never got to where the ice cream was. <laughs> but we knew where our hotel was, so we were okay. We decided we would do without the ice cream. But when we all came to that point that we recognized that we knew, there was a certain safety that was there. There was certainly an acknowledgement of understanding that we're okay. Dale Money has not killed us. <laughs> you know what last Sunday was? Last Sunday was everybody coming to a common point that we know and that we understand. We looked at the cross. We looked at the empty tomb. And for someone who knows Christ, that's a landmark that every one of us should be familiar with. But the question isn't this. We may know where we were at last week, but the question is this. Moving forward, where are we going? Just as it says that they looked down and looked into the tomb, we looked into the tomb last week and it was a sight that gives us comfort and gives us safety because we recognize it. But can I tell you this? Moving forward this year as Christians, this Sunday, the tomb is still empty. But where we go from here may be difficult. It may be scary. It may cause anxiety. It may be hard. It may not be an easily traveled road for the disciples moving forward from this point. They all understood and ultimately died for their belief in that empty tomb. And they had seen the resurrected Savior. Do you think they believed it? Amen. They certainly did because they died for it. Yes, it's triumph when we look and preach and sing and understand the reality of the empty tomb. But know this, there's some place for us to go from here. For the followers of Christ, the empty tomb wasn't the end of the story. It was the beginning. It, it was the end of one, uh, of one covenant and the beginning of the next. It was launching them as pioneers into something that they had never experienced and the world had never known. Last week, we looked at the empty tomb. We looked at Easter. We looked at what that means. But every one of us ought to be familiar with this truth. It may launch us into pioneering something that we've never done before. It may set you on a, on a road and a course for something that you've never experienced. And what may lie ahead may be trepidation. It may be fear. It may be a, a lack of understanding. And we see all those things in the coming days for the disciples following the resurrection. In John 20, verse number, verse number 1. The first day of the week, cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher. 
and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, which was who? John. They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Well, she had a lack of understanding, didn't she? I tell you this, last week many people approached Easter and the resurrection with a lack of understanding of what really had transpired and happened. Many celebrated something that they see as a secular holiday. They didn't understand the truth of it. Hey, I, I don't have any problem with bunnies and eggs and, and all that stuff in its proper place. And that's somewhere far, 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 far below the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Verse number five, Peter therefore went forth and the other disciples and came to the sepulcher. And they ran both together. Who were both? Peter and John. And the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie and the napkin that was about his head not lying with the linen cloths but wrapped together in a place by itself. It's an interesting phrase and I've heard messages preached on this but I want to give us an accurate and biblical understanding of that. Here's the idea when you study this verbiage out. What it means is this. When they came in and saw the linen clothes, they were there in the place where they belonged. But there was no body inside of them. It, it was as if he had just disappeared right out of the clothes. That's some pretty strong evidence, isn't it? Amen. Hey, if it was grave robbers, they would have ripped those pieces of fabric apart. If they had stolen the body, they could not have stolen the body and taken him directly out of those grave clothes that laid still bound together. Even that small phrase and that understanding of the grave clothes laid there as they were yet absent of a human body or any body gives great evidence to the truth of the resurrection. It would have been impossible for them to steal it. The spices and the things that were used, the ointments and oils that were used on those rags that were wrapped around the body, within a matter of hours began to harden and form almost a shell around that body, and he disappeared from it. I've heard several people preach. It says that the, the napkin that was over his, his face was folded separately from the others. There's some great truths that, that are there, Okay. But can I tell you something? And if your favorite preacher preached about this, I'm sorry. That was not a dinner napkin. <laughs> People say, well, at dinner they would fold the napkin and they would put it in a specific place in, in, uh, uh, in Hebrew uh, culture, and that meant they were coming back again. Hey, he, he had already said that he was coming back again, okay? This was not a dinner napkin. This gives us this reality that there was a consciousness of the resurrection that he took a physical act to take it and lay it aside and apart before he departed. So it does teach us a truth, but not necessarily that truth. Does it make for good preaching to say that they would take the dinner napkin and set it to the side and it meant that they were coming back again? Absolutely, it makes for good preaching. But the reality of it is this, a conscious person came out of those grave clothes, took it, folded it, set it to the side, and soon they would see him as who, who the, the thought was the keeper of the garden. I, I think it's so interesting when you read. Anybody else picture this in your mind? Like Peter takes off. How many think Peter would have been the first one to go? He was gone like a rocket, wasn't he? But I don't know if he was fat, if he was slow, or if, uh, if John was in better shape or what, or if he was more motivated, but John overtakes him on the way, and he's the first one there, but what? He sees the stone rolled away, and he's not going in. And Peter, nothing holds him back, right? What did he do? He just went on in. i got to see what's going on. We keep reading. It says, 
in verse number 8, And went in also that other disciple which came first, John, to the sepulcher, and he saw, and what does it say? And he saw him and believed. What did he believe? Well, what did he believe? It says he saw and believed. What did he believe? He believed the resurrection, that what Jesus had told them and preached for the last three years was true. That when he said that if they destroy this temple, that what? In three days I'll raise it up again. That when he prophesied that as Jonas was in the, in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, even so shall the Son of Man be in the earth. Hey, it says three days and three nights, by the way. I talked about this last week. We don't have to rehearse it again. It wasn't a day and a half. It was three days and and three nights. If it just said three days, you may be able to say, well, if it was three days, then it's part of this day and part of this day and part of another day. But Jesus himself verified the reality that representative of those three days were three nights as well. Amen. It says that he looked in and he believed what Jesus had preached. All of a sudden he recognized him for who he was, the Son of God. As they stooped down, they look in and they believe. Many have looked into that same empty grave. For 2,000 years, and they've come to the same faith and the same belief. These disciples' world have been turned upside down. Just as I stood in Hero Square in Budapest and looked at these huge granite statues that represented great victories. Last week, we stood in a place that we recognized and knew, and every one of us would know when we came to a common place, and there at that place of the empty tomb stands these granite monuments that are reminders to us that our faith is different than the faith of this world, that the faith of Christianity is the only faith. Hey, there's a giant statue that stands, a monument that reminds us that when we look in the empty tomb, and you know what it reminds us? It reminds us that we have the only Savior that conquered death in the grave. We've got the only one that went into the grave and came out again. No other religion even makes that claim. When we look, we see there's some many things that the empty grave reminds us of. It reminds us that Jesus was the Son of God. He was who He said He was. Look in Romans chapter number 1. Look in Romans chapter number 1. Verse number 4. Actually, let's go to verse number 3. If you're not there yet, just listen to what the Word of God says. This is important. Focus on the words when I, when I read the Scripture. Now, I can say a lot of things, but the Word of God can pierce our hearts. Concerning His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be what? The Son of God with power. That's who He said He was according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Hey, that commonplace that we come to, one of those great monuments of our faith in Christ is this reminder that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And Romans chapter 1 and verse number 4 says, it was verified by the truth of the empty grave. Amen. Say, what other monuments do we see there? 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, verse number 14, just listen. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Another monument is this that we can look at. An unmovable, unshakable reminder that just as he resurrected one day, we also will what? Resurrect as well. Whether we go through the grave or whether we go through the clouds. Go to Hebrews chapter number 7. Hebrews chapter number 7. What else do we see on this road map as we stand first at a common location and look around and look at the great monuments of the faith of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Hebrews chapter number 7. All these things, both in, uh, both in 1 Thessalonians 4 and Romans chapter number 1, were verified by what? It says they were verified by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 7, look at verse number 25. Let's go back up a few verses. Verse 22, By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. Amen. Are you glad that there's a better testament? 
That's what the book of Hebrews is at a better way. We don't have to kill animals on the Day of Atonement. We don't have to make sacrifice daily for our sins. The priest doesn't have to move in continually in and out of the temple and in and out of the tabernacle making sacrifices in, in, uh, in obedience to God. But it says that he went in one time to the holy place and made sacrifice for us. By so much was Jesus made a, sure, a surety of a better testament. What is surety? It's a guarantee. I was talking to someone about the other day. They said, never sign for anybody, even your kids, as surety. They said, don't do it. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> the surety or the guarantee that we have is who? Jesus Christ. The New Testament is secured and guaranteed, and the promise of heaven is guaranteed by what? Now, Surety normally comes with what? A financial commitment, a price that was paid. His death was the payment that was made. His resurrection was the receipt that said that it was enough, sufficient before a holy God. The surety that secures it today is wrapped up in the same. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. Whew! Man, that's a powerful verse, number 23. Hey, there had to be a bunch of priests because what? they all going to die. Jesus died, but he conquered death. He was different than the others. He is our great high priest, verse, 20, uh, verse uh, number 24. But this man, who is this man? Jesus Christ. Because he continueth ever and liveth forever, right? Half an unchangeable priesthood. This makes you want to go back and preach the book of Hebrews again. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. It says he ever what? Liveth. Hey, he doesn't just live on Easter Sunday. He lives on this Sunday as well. Amen. And he's lived in the seven days we've experienced, six days we've experienced in between also. But it says that because of his resurrection, we know this. What does it say? There's two things in verse number, uh, in, uh, uh, verse number 25. He is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God. Why? Seeing is what? Seeing that he ever liveth. So he's still able to save, and he's also able to do what? Make intercession for us. One of the other great monuments of our faith that we look at when we consider Resurrection Sunday and the empty tomb is this. There's a continued ministry of Jesus Christ. He's continuing to save all those who would call upon the name of the Lord. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For any that would put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, today salvation is available. Freedom, escape. If, anyone be, uh, 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 if, uh, uh, if any man be in Christ, he is a, a new creature. You can experience that new life, that salvation today, just as powerfully on this day as it was more than 2,000 years ago when he rose from the dead. But not only is it the power to save them, but also it tells us his continued ministry is to save are you glad that he has a continued ministry even today of salvation if you're thankful for that say amen, amen. but it also says what he ever liveth what is his is his ministry just to continue to save and i don't mean that just in a in a lessening sense but in a sense of solidarity and a, 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 of a, of singularity is it only that he is, is saving because he ever liveth what to make intercession so yes, he's still saving, but for those who've put their faith and have already been saved, what's he doing? He's making intercession for us. Well, we should be reminded on this roadmap, as before we depart, as we look at the empty graves, we come to this common place, before we endeavor into what God has for us in the coming days, months, and years, we ought to be reminded by these great monuments. And one of those reminders is this. The work of Christ wasn't finished when he came out of the grave. His ministry continues. The work of salvation was finished. It was done. It says in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 2 that he went and he sat at the right hand of the throne of God. That he sat down because it was what? Finished. The priest had to do it every day. This priest did it once and then he sat down because it was done. That was finished, but his ministry continues. Hey, he's still making intercession, and he's still saving. Amen. How you'd love to see him save somebody this morning. It would be a great thing, wouldn't it? We also see 
the satisfaction of God with this sacrifice. And we'll see the distinction. We talked about it already. Of Christianity, separate, apart, separate and apart from all man-made religion. But as we depart from this place, there's a take a deep breath now. There's five quick things. <laughs> And we will go through them quickly. I want us to remember. Where do we go from here? What's on the road map? Luke 24 and verse number 5. What does the angel say? Why seek ye the living among the dead? You know, first of all, we're going to see this. First of all, we ought to make sure we're committed to seek him diligently. Why did they come to the tomb? Because they were looking for Jesus. Why were they worried when they saw the stone rolled away? Because they wanted to know where Jesus was at. When the man in the garden came and talked to Mary, when she was confused and didn't know who this was, and he spoke her name, guess what? She immediately knew who it was. I don't know where you are in your journey of your Christian life. Last week brought us all to a common place. The coming weeks will scatter us in many different routes of our spiritual journey. But no matter what it is, would you do this? Would you diligently seek after him? Diligently pursue what he has for you? He says, why seek ye the living among the dead? Many today look for life and the things that are dead and cannot give it. Hey, can I tell you this? This morning, don't get mad at me. Religion is dead. Jesus is alive. Amen. The wealth of this world is dead. But Jesus, he's alive. Amen. Your own way, your own thoughts, your own path, and your own ability to do what's right before a holy God is dead. But this morning, Jesus is alive. Amen. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Why seek for that eternal life after things which are already dead? If you seek Jesus Christ, you don't seek that which is dead. You seek that which is still alive and liveth forever. That's the quality and the pursuit of Jesus that's different than any other pursuit this world has ever known. All that this world has will pass away. All who have lived short of the rapture of the church will go the same way through the grave. But he's the only one to go into the grave and come out again. He's the only one to resurrect himself from the dead. Hey, pursue him. Diligently seek after him. For your families, seek after him. For your life that needs a different course, hey, set in the destination, Jesus. The Apostle Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind. He said, I pressed toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He gives the idea of the race of the Greeks and even of the Romans. The races then were not sprints. They were endurance races. And at the end of the race, there was a pole that normally had a, a colored and typically red stripe that went around it. When they came to the end, that was signifying of the goal. And the first one to come and lay hold of that pole was the winner. The Apostle Paul says, I am apprehended for that which I apprehend. You know what he said? He said, the goal is Jesus Christ, and I'm focusing on him. He said, now I want to grab a hold of that which I'm pursuing, but that which I'm pursuing has already got a hold of me. We're following Jesus Christ and we have our eyes fixed on him just like Paul did. But to obtain him, he's unobtainable. To obtain him is to allow him to obtain you. To apprehend is to allow him to apprehend you. To be set free in Christ. And if Christ makes you free, you shall be what? Free indeed? It's to make yourself captive to him. You say, I don't understand that. I don't either. But I've lived it and experienced it, and I know that it's true. Amen. Second thing we see, 
Luke chapter 24, a few verses down. Luke 24, verse number 50. Luke 24, before he ascends and led them out as far as Bethany and lifted up his hands and blessed them. Verse 51, and it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. This is his ascension. Verse 52, and they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. Hey, here is a good example of what to do after we leave that common place of the empty tomb of Jesus Christ when he had departed from us and ascended to heaven hey they didn't gather less they what they gathered more they didn't find themselves less in the company of other believers but they found themselves what more in the company of other believers is that what this text says they worshiped him and they did what daily they were in the temple I can't believe Pastor Phil has all this stuff that's going on Saturday mornings and we got Sunday morning and Sunday night and we got Wednesdays. It must be just terrible. Actually, it's not. It's actually wonderful. I love it. Amen. If you miss out, you're the only one that misses out, right? Amen. But we're reminded that the disciples, after seeing the resurrected Savior and experiencing him, after looking at that empty tomb, it did not compel them to worship him less. It compelled them to worship him more. They were not compelled to gather less, but they were compelled to gather more. What's the scripture say? Forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. Do you believe that's scripture? Do you think the Bible teaches we ought to gather together as a church? What's the next phrase? And so much the more as we see what? the day approaching what's the day is it Easter is it Monday Friday what is the day the day that's coming is the return of Christ not the rapture of the church but the return of Christ when he splits the clouds wide open but he doesn't stop there like he does during the rapture he comes and he sets his feet on the Mount of Olives and splits it right in half and he ascends down to Jerusalem through the eastern gate and goes to the throne of David to reign and rule forever and ever hey that's the day that it's talking about when we look at the condition of our world we can say our world is lost and they are we can say there's not much hope but we know there's hope in Jesus Christ we can say that things are difficult and we can see the signs of the times and understand that his coming is getting closer and closer and it ought to push us and pressure us not to find comfort in the things of this world not to find comfort in our occupations our own goals that we've set forth for ourselves but it ought to say hey we ought to get together with God's people we ought to fulfill God's purpose we ought to work for his kingdom and knowing this that the day of his return is closer now than it's ever been before every step on that journey of your Christian life ought to bring you closer closer to him it ought to draw you closer to him knowing that one day you will be with him but as you see that day approaching we ought to work more we ought to gather more we ought to give more we ought to labor more and we ought to do more for the cause of Christ you say I don't like that pastor Phil then you don't like what the Bible has to say they worshiped him more they gathered more frequently Acts 4 and verse number 33, they boldly shared his message. Hey, what about Peter? The message he shared at the fire was what? I don't know that man. The message he shared at Pentecost. Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he died for it. You know what Peter did? How did Peter die? How was he crucified? He was crucified upside down. He said, I'm not worthy to be crucified like Jesus was. And they crucified him upside down. Because he didn't think he was worthy to die like his Savior did. You think he believed it? You think the one that looked down into that tomb and saw those grave clothes laying there absent of the body and the the napkin that was folded and laid to the side? 
the stone that was rolled away? You think he believed that he had risen from the dead? Hey, the critics of the day, well, did Jesus really rise from the dead? Why don't you ask those who were there? They died for it. Yep. Help me out. I'm not real smart. You've probably already figured that out. That's enough from you, Jake. <laughs> As I, I was talking to my dad about this this morning. He couldn't remember something, and I said, you're getting old. And he said, I am. I make fun of me. Everybody says amen. I make fun of my dad. Everybody's going, oh, that's terrible. <laughs> Not one amen from that. He said he was getting old. I said, you are. <laughs> oh, man, nothing, nothing, nothing. All right. But if something happens today, even at my youthful age, if something happens today, I can usually remember it, have a pretty good idea as being a first-hand witness of it, right? If something happens next week, mm. if something happens a year from now, and I told Glenn about it, and he rehearses it, you think, well, I don't know about that. 2,000 years ago, we think we can be critics of those who saw it as firsthand, and that we're going to have some kind of valid explanation to add to what the Word of God and the firsthand witnesses who saw the empty grave already said? That's ludicrous. Amen. We see that we ought to boldly proclaim the message. Write down Acts 4.33 there. We ought to trust Him completely. John 20.29. 20, you know what it says? He says, Thomas, you've believed because you've seen. And then he says, what well, blessed are those who have not seen and yet still believe. Yep. Hey, trust him completely. Amen. Hey, our, our little graphic there. I mean, Brother Michael does a good job doing our graphics for our messages, doesn't he? Amen. And you see uh, the idea of our, our message. Hey, here's where we were last week. There's a destination spiritually for all of us. Ultimately, it's the same destination, but we're taking different paths there, right? But one day we'll all be at the same final destination. But as we consider that and as, as we think about that, you know what? To, to have been someplace and to see it is one thing. To trust him by faith, not having seen it, is something different. Amen. You may not know what tomorrow holds, and the truth is that we don't. We may not know what's out there in the future, and the reality is that we don't. But why don't we trust the one who does? What did Thomas say? Lest I thrust my hands into his side and I touch the scars that are on his hands. In 1 John chapter number 1, though, what does John say? The beloved. He says, hey, that which we have seen, that which we have looked upon, that which our hands have handled the word of life. You know what he said? I saw him. I touched him. I saw the scars and I, I, and I touched them. He says, that which was manifest unto you, declare we unto you. These were first-hand witnesses declaring to us the truth. It's become cliche, but it's still true. We might not know what tomorrow holds, but we know who holds tomorrow. Turn to Hebrews 9, I'll be done. Where do we go from here? Hebrews chapter 9, look at verse number 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin, unto salvation. We ought to await Him joyfully. We ought to be looking for that day that's coming. Amen. Hebrews 9, 28, it says when He comes the second time, it says without sin unto salvation. What does it mean without sin? Study it out. You know what it means? He won't have to deal with sin this time when He comes because He already dealt with it. Yeah. Amen. He won't have to die again because He already died. 
for it. Then it says, unto salvation. Haven't we already been saved? When is the full completion of what we'll understand as our salvation? When he comes again. Hey, right now we live free from the penalty of sin. But one day we'll live free from the presence of sin. It still carries the same idea to save us. It's the final, final step when he comes and he sets up his eternal kingdom and the presence of sin will be gone for all of eternity. I don't know where each of you are. I know we've gathered at a common place that we all recognize. And that's the cross of Christ and his empty tomb. Our destination as believers in Christ from here will be the same. Our journeys and our paths will be different. They all ought to reflect these truths that we see from his followers and his disciples that we read about in the word of God. Hey, are you trusting him completely? Are you joyfully awaiting his return? Are you boldly proclaiming his message? Are you worshiping him wholeheartedly? Seeking him diligently? Maybe there's some you'd say, I don't know that I'm on that same path. I don't know that the end of the story for me is heaven because I don't know that I'm saved. You could make that decision this morning. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one's looking around.